What are you going to do? Something so very, very painful, so hideous. That I will make lots of headlines. The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I present to you a quick review of the Anne Boleyn miniseries. Before we begin, though, it would be prudent to go a bit into the history of this production and how it came into being. The end of the last decade saw a bit of a revival of Tudor dramas, much to my annoyance, and this trend has continued at the start of this new one. In August of 2020, Ben Frau, known for being the head of Channel 5, and also a James Bond villain in his spare time, announced that his channel, for reasons known only unto God, would be making a three-hour miniseries about the downfall of Anne Boleyn, a topic that the writers would later claim has never been told from her perspective. <laughs> October, though, would see some more information. Most notably that Channel 5 would actually be doing something different by throwing any attempt at authenticity out of the window, with the series going for colour-conscious casting. Filming of the series lasted for a mere six weeks. To put that into context, Becoming Elizabeth, an upcoming eight-hour series on the young Elizabeth I, took six months to film. I'm sure the rushed filming schedule of Anne Boleyn did not impact the series in any way at all. Anne Boleyn finally released in 2021, and boy was it bad. Unfortunately, probably as Channel 5 intended, attention was diverted away from the quality of the series towards arguments over the casting. And even to this day, my audience and I are now apparently raging misogynists, sexists, racists, and anti-Semites for daring to review this new Tudor drama in the same fashion I've literally viewed every other one across my career on YouTube. Why should I believe you? You're Hitler! No! Finally though, now that the series is done, and the dust has settled a bit, we can actually try and examine the flaws of the miniseries. The series takes place between the 8th of January and the 19th of May 1536, focusing on the downfall of Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of King Henry VIII. Unfortunately though, the series threw a lot of the interesting historical aspects of this story out of the window. Jodie Turner-Smith's portrayal of Anne Boleyn is constrained by terrible writing throughout. For a show that was touted as a psychological thriller, you don't really get much of that. Instead, the first two episodes are mainly Anne trying to boss people around, whilst the script tries to claim she is sympathetic, with the last episode being her trial and execution. Probably the second most controversial part of the series happens in episode 1, when Anne decides to kiss Jane Seymour on the lips. Yes, really. Now, there is a source from a bit earlier in the 1510s, shown on screen now, that does state that the Tudor women did sometimes kiss each other on the lips as a way of greeting, but that is not what is being shown here, and given their cavalier attitude to research, I doubt they were aware of this, otherwise they would have mentioned it in the interviews. Lola Pettigrew, who plays Jane Seymour, had this justification. It's definitely something that I think will be a talking point for a lot of people, she says. Very simply, it was Anne assessing what was before her, and her sort of interest in Jane. Sometimes Anne sees Jane through the male gaze, and she's trying to see what her husband, King Henry VIII, sees, which I think is really interesting, because it's the male gaze through a female gaze, which I think is really beautiful. No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. Oh, we also get the third worst part in episode one as well. It's all racking up now, isn't it? Mad Shelton, the king's former mistress, is instructed by Anne to have an affair with the king again, so he will be distracted from Jane and thus won't turn on Anne. I... eh? I know some have tried to claim this as a thing, but what sort of logic is that? To encourage your husband to have an affair with another woman so he won't run off with another woman? Eh? Anne argued with Henry over his infidelities, so I cannot see her agreeing to such a thing. Not to mention it is only mentioned once and never heard about again in this series, making this whole plotline completely pointless. Anne's power is vastly overstated in this production. 
Hell, they even changed the royal coat of arms of the whole kingdom to have her badge on it to show this. She apparently has the authority to intercept ambassadors' correspondence, and even the power of life and death, ordering some woman who tries to kill her to be strapped up on the tower for all to see. God, even Henry VIII gave people a show trial before killing the man. On top of that, she comes across as very haughty and aggressive, even to people on her side. For example, when the Duke of Norfolk recommends that she try and be gentle with the king, who is in a bad mood, but instead of taking his advice, she lectures him and ends it with, off you trot. Now, Anne was definitely proud, and of course would argue with people, as any human would do. However, there would at least be a sense of formality when the Queen is talking to a peer of the realm, arguably the most important peer, in a more formal setting, and particularly when that peer is her own uncle. Ah oh well, at least we've got scenes of her trying to strangle the King whilst bonking him, whilst also simultaneously pregnant. It was a vital part of the director's vision. I will be fair, though, that they did try and sow some of her intellectual side, and her dispute with Cromwell over the monasteries was brought up, but that was nowhere near enough to make up for the other failings. When watching this, I initially thought episode 2 wasn't as bad as the first, right up until the last 10 minutes. The story had been going along at a decent pace, when, suddenly, we go straight to her arrest. We skip what must be at least two months in the run-up to the event, missing out important plot points such as the sermon John Skip gave in early April, denouncing evil advisers. A clear warning from Anne to Cromwell, which may have helped prompt him to act against the Queen. We don't see any arrests of the gentleman she was accused of having affairs with. Nothing. Straight to the Tower. Of course, Anne isn't too happy about this, and proceeds to imitate Tommy Wiseau from the room. You are lying! I never hit you! You are tearing me apart, Lisa! The trial scenes have some accurate bits sprinkled here and there, but overall it has some pretty terrible moments that I will expand upon when we get to Cromwell. Ah well, at least her execution scene, which we have very firm sources on, will surely make up for... Oh wait, hang on, they just cut out the bulk of it and she doesn't even give a final speech? Why was the execution speech left out of the final cut? In a drama about the fall of Anne Boleyn, don't you think her last words are vital? Well, if it were present, then we would not have been able to have this pivotal scene where Anne needs to use the privy, but has to endure her ladies watching her go. This was a key part of the director's vision. Only true 4D chess players would understand. Mark Stanley as King Henry VIII was pretty underwhelming. He lacks the real physical presence of the king, who was a fair bit taller than his wife. Yet here, she looks more imposing than he does. Yes, he does at least have reddish hair and a beard like the king, but the height issue is a major one for me. Henry had a real presence and should be towering over his court. And even if we take the height out of the equation, he's really lacking when it comes to portraying the role. Don't look at him! Look at me! You promised me sons! <laughs> we didn't get some of the same old myths popping up. For example, the jousting accident. Even to this day, serious historians claim that the king's jousting accident in 1536 was so serious that he was knocked unconscious for hours, but this is not backed up by contemporary evidence. The imperial ambassador in England and Risley all say the king was fine after the accident and sustained no serious injury. Yet for some reason, historians keep referencing the account of the imperial ambassador in Rome who wasn't even there and heard a second hand from the ambassador in France. Can we also stop trying to claim that having a bonk on the head suddenly turned him into a tyrant? He'd been executing people since almost day one if he felt it were convenient, regardless of evidence. You could have corrected the record on this Channel 5 and done what you promised to do with telling the real history, but you did not. Overall though, whilst this Henry is probably better than the version we have to deal with in Spanish Princess, he's certainly towards the bottom of my list when it comes to portrayals of Henry. Probably one of the worst parts of me was Thomas Cromwell, played by Barry Ward. He shall henceforth be referred to as Thomas Smugwell, to differentiate him from the real-life figure. As mentioned in the trailer rant, he barely resembles the person he's meant to be playing, bar the haircut, I guess, but... As Mark Rylance has proven, that does not always lead to a worst character, but it doesn't help when the plot is fudged as well. Now, I did appreciate some bits here and there, such as his desire to secure an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire at the expense of France, which leads to conflict with the pro-French Anne as well as mentioned here and there about their disagreements over the dissolution of the monasteries, as mentioned earlier. But it is not enough to fully flesh out the relationship between the two. You never get any indication that they were firm allies at one point in time, and Smogwell just comes across as a caricature of the Weasley servant whispering in the king's ear. 
This gets worse when we get to the trial, where Smugwell proceeds to use his knowledge of Ace Attorney to try and get bonus points, but it is not done very well. Hell, the whole trial scene is done terribly. In the real trial, there were plenty of men who knew the whole thing was a sham, but had to go along with it. One moment that would have been interesting to see is the reaction of Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland. He had been in love with Anne back in the 1520s, and in 1536 was a judge at the trial. When the verdict was read out, the Earl apparently collapsed and had to be carried out. In this one, though, they all seem on board with the guilty verdict, quite willingly. Of course, showing the truth would require us to actually learn something about Anne's history, but nah, we need the scenes of her kissing Jane Seymour instead. The rest of the characters are pretty bland and barely did anything new with this groundbreaking drama, as the media claimed. Lady Jane Rochford, for example, is portrayed as being conniving and plotting, even being called as a witness at Anne's trial. In reality, she was nothing like this at all, but has been portrayed like this in pretty much every drama since the beginning of Tudor dramas. They could have corrected the record on this and actually do what they claimed, but yet again they did not because they do not care. George Boleyn tried, but was hindered by an awful script and had such stupid plot lines like having an illegitimate son with Elizabeth Somerset, the Countess of Worcester. Why was this stupid and fictional plotline in here? Well, Eve Hedwig Turner McGee, or whatever her name is, had this to say. Obviously, one of the main factors in that was the amount of danger everyone surrounding Anne was put in, as soon as she was a suspect of treason, and Lizzie would have been in a lot of danger herself. But I felt like it would be great to find another dramatic reason for that. I'd read that she was pregnant around that time, and that Anne had sent her money for her baby. And I also knew on the other side of the coin that George Boleyn and Jane Boleyn, his wife, never had a very good relationship and were always at odds with each other. Press X to doubt. And Jane Boleyn was also one of the key witnesses at the trial. Press X to doubt. So I wondered what we would get from suggesting that Lizzie and George had this relationship blossoming on the side and that Lizzie had felt betrayed by Anne when she... <coughs> when she said, you know you can't pursue this. You have to put it to one side for the sake of us all and our reputations. And that gave Jane Boleyn another spur in order to stab both George and Anne in the back at the trial as well. So that was one where it felt like it was, you know, definitely a liberty on my part, but felt like it fit in with the story pretty well. The ride doesn't end there with the characters though, and I've barely scratched the surface with them, but if I keep going then this would have been a full hour video. Let us go on to authenticity for now. As you've probably guessed by now, authenticity is basically non-existent in this production, and to start off, I think it is time to address the reason why you're all here. The casting. I've made my views on this pretty clear in the past, so won't repeat them too much here, but suffice to say my mind hasn't changed. When I watch a period drama, I like to feel immersed in the world, and the casting certainly did not do that for me. Not to worry though, Twitter is at hand to help us out, by reminding us that period dramas such as the Flintstones aren't 100% accurate, therefore we should just give up on the authenticity thing. Hell, apparently it is fine now that John Wayne played Genghis Khan in The Conqueror, a film so cancerous it literally caused cancer. I noticed of course that the series could have adapted actual black roles from this time period, or drawn inspiration from them, John Blank being the prime example, but Channel 5 merely wanted some hyperbolic and outrageous headlines to pump up drama and thus views. Why was this? Well, the overall quality of the production would probably be a main one. As we've seen, the writing and acting in general is pretty mediocre, so it wasn't going to be saved on that front. And as for the sets, costumes, etc., it is even worse. By now, most of you are probably sick of hearing about different types of hoods, but briefly, women in this time period wore hoods to cover their hair, which was always tied up unless it was a special event, like a coronation of the Queen, for example. The English hood was still quite common, but was giving way to the French hood and often politics could be played with your fashion. Jane Seymour, for example, encouraged the use of English hoods amongst her ladies-in-waiting, as a way to establish herself as a traditional English woman compared to the pro-French Anne. Now let me have a look for some English... Oh wait, there are none present. Not one English hood. Not even on Jane. In fact, she's wearing a French hood in this one for some reason. Meanwhile, some people are wearing a sort of French hood, but they're missing the veil, have the hair loose, and the hoods themselves are nothing more than headbands. Very cheap looking ones as well, may I say, compared to the more luxurious jewel laden ones you would expect to see at court. The fact becoming Elizabeth, filmed not long after this one, has some decent French hoods. So why was it like this in Anne Boleyn? Well, the designer had this to say on the issue. I made a decision. 
not to have any embellishments or embroidery around the neckline, which amplifies the neckline and heightens the severity of the cut in a way that really pops on camera. Ah yes, because the Tudors are well known to shun things like jewellery and embroidery. Oh wait, they had a lot of jewels and so on as a way of showing off their power. Oops. The article then goes on to say this. She took inspiration from modern catwalks, including the jewel tones of the designer Christopher John Rogers and Prato headbands for sleek reinterpretations of another of Berlin's favourites, the French hood, as well as tapestries and Hans Holbein paintings. The costumes are not historically accurate by any means, said Moore, but the Tudor essence of the silhouette is there, with the modern spin on it. <sighs> I'm wondering at this point if Becoming Elizabeth nicked all the good Tudor costumes. I know Channel 5 had a small budget, but there is no excuse not to try and get the costumes somewhat right at least. The 1970 BBC series, despite a few hiccups with the hoods and dresses here and there, more or less got it right and they were having to spray paint polystyrene coffee cups due to lack of funds. A fair warning to you all, if I ever gain any sort of political power, I'm having fashion designers, the word contemporary, and Channel 5 banned. My first act will be to kill the whole lot of you and burn your turn to cinders! Thanks, on. I know it's on! Whilst we were talking about hair-related topics, can I just question the choice of using Attack of the Clones as the inspiration for Anne Boleyn's hairstyle? Jodie Turner-Smith herself has to shoulder some of the blame for this, I'm afraid. In an interview with Glamour magazine, she said this about the hairstyle she went for in this, allegedly, historical series. When I went into Anne Boleyn, we spoke extensively about what my vision was, and it was interesting to see how closely it mirrored the production teams. I was very excited to see that. It was really important to me that Anne had afro-texture hair. In my mind, I was like, my Queen Anne. This is a woman who I did not want to put on European texture hair. I wanted kinky hair that she's been growing her whole life. Anyone else remember the days when actors would try to become the character they were playing, not the other way around? I remember. Most of the filming took place on location in Yorkshire, at places such as Bolton Castle and at St Michael's Church in Emley to name a few. As I moaned about in the trailer rant video, the choice of having a church stand in for the Great Hall at the Tower of London was a bad one. It looks nothing like the real one. And I wonder if it would have been better just to build a set back at the studios, really. Even if it would be cheap plywood or something. In fact, the same goes for a lot of the tower scenes. The Queen's apartments look even worse close up than when I saw them in the trailer. Here, they are really filthy and disgusting compared to the historically fairly up-to-date and comfortable ones Anne had. A more competent creator could have had her stay in the same room she was in before her coronation, amongst the luxury of her former position, and then have a flashback comparing her situation then to the present. But alas, we can't have that. Overall then, a pretty terrible job on the authenticity front. It appears that, yet again, people who have little to no love for this time period are at the helm, leading to another one to add to the growing list of really inaccurate dramas. Still, some of my audience liked the trailer and thought it was pretty good, Oh wait, sorry, it was actually an advert for Raid Shadow Legends. Suffice to say, this aspect of the series was pretty dire as well. I've gone with this a bit, but it bears repeating. Anne Boleyn and George Boleyn were about the only ones really trying in this series. Everyone else's performance were either like soggy cardboard, or were so hammy that I was having flashbacks to the Lady of the Green Kirtle in the Silver Chair. Smugwell in particular was chewing the ham so much that he became insufferable in the last episode. I guess I shouldn't be too hard on the actors when they had to deal with some pretty bad scripts. I mean, I don't know what you can do when your lines consist of things like I wasn't aware that fudging the king was such a chore, off you trot, and my personal favourite, you have her smell all over you like melted butter. In my mind implying that Jane Seymour uses it as a form of perfume. You have her smell all over you like melted butter. I can't believe it's not butter, can you? <sighs> Seems like there's less of everything these days. Mm. Cringe-inducing dialogue aside, the series also goes overboard and hitting you over the head to tell you how subtle the foreshadowing events are. Oh look, the king's horse that you can't use anymore is getting killed with a sword. I'm sure there's totally not a subtle reference to what is going to happen to Anne. Or Francis Weston saying, I'd rather my head was taken from my shoulders. Totally not foreshadowing him having his head cut off. Although, I will be fair here, I vaguely remember reading somewhere that he might have said that, but I could not confirm the reference, so for now it will go on the list. The series also suffered from pretty poor pacing. 
Episode 2, for example, has Anne suddenly arrested right at the end with barely any build-up, as I went into a bit earlier. We don't get any scenes of Cromwell interrogating Mark Smeaton. In fact, I just realised he's barely even in this one. You know, the first man Cromwell accused of having an affair with the Queen, whose testimony led to the arrests and eventual deaths of Anne, her brother and three other men. Can't have him. I'm glad they met up at that plot with the Countess of Worcester getting pranked with George Boleyn, though. It's a good thing to cut a vital plot line from your story and then replace it with one that goes nowhere. Anyway, you have episode 1 barely covering January 1536, episode 2 starting in February, and only covering a few weeks before suddenly jumping forward without warning to May and her arrest, and then episode 3 being the trial and execution. Important characters as well are introduced on the flip of a coin, the most prominent example being Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who I can't recall one mention of before his arrival towards the end of episode 3. For a man who was an ally of Anne Boleyn and the most senior figure in the Church of England behind the King, don't you think you should have had him in this a bit earlier? The music was also a bit off. Although, seeing as though this was a cheap TV production, I shouldn't be too surprised. The intro in particular was very weird, especially with the kaleidoscope thing that was going on. I've said this before, but I don't know why Tudor dramas these days don't make more use of the music of the period. A Man for All Seasons, Henry VIII and the Six Wives, Anne of the Thousand Days, etc. all drew their soundtracks from that period, and it really helped set the mood. The more modern generic stuff we get these days does not do that at all for me. Well, at least I can take some solace in the fact that I am not alone in my hatred of this series. In fact, it got a very low score of 1.9 on the IMDb. Not on my shift! Wait, he actually went as far as to basically vote Riggit to defend the series? Wow. Perhaps I'll have to add the Internet Movie Database to my list of banned things then. Overall, whilst perhaps not as bad as The Spanish Princess, and oh boy am I looking forward to dealing with that mess, this Anne Boleyn drama will certainly go down as a rather notorious outrage grab, for want of a better term, made purely to generate articles on the internet in order to drive up revenue. It looks like this strategy has not worked for them though, with viewing figures plummeting, not that this has deterred the creators of this series, who seem determined to put young Catherine Howard on the chopping block next, no pun intended. Personally, I doubt we will see this one get made, although then again, Channel 5 might be desperate slash foolish enough to waste more money. Since they apparently want to pull a similar stunt with the casting for this Catherine Howard sequel, I expect the quality of that one will be even worse. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.